wherever you are and whenever you are watching, welcome to Killerman Church. This is the online version of our worship for Sunday, the 9th of May, 2020. So now, what should we do? That was what a crowd in the ancient city of Jerusalem asked 2,000 years ago. Right now, around the world, today, people are asking the same question. A question provoked by grasping who Jesus is and realising that their lives can and must change. Let's gather in prayer before God. Almighty God, we're here to give you our best, our time and our attention. We owe you nothing less, and yet we need your help. We pray for peace to hear you and honesty before you. For if we are being honest, there's much to make us squirm. Words spoken, things we've done, thoughts that are corroding our relationship with you and eating away at our love for our neighbours. Lord God, we've become world class at avoiding thinking about our sins. But in these moments, give us the courage to remember without making excuses and catch us as we reel, as we stagger with horrid realisation of what we've become because we've kept you away. Father God, we thank you that when we ask, what must I do? Our guilt never has the last word. Jesus, our Saviour, we rejoice that if we allow, you will replace the pain of self-awareness with deep and lasting peace. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you in to transform us from regret to rejoicing, from despair to delight in being children of the living God. To you, Father, Son and Spirit, be all honour and glory. Amen. We're back in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, picking up where we left off last week. Jesus, crucified, dead and buried, has been raised from the dead. After 40 days of being seen, heard, touched by his followers and hundreds of others, Jesus has been exalted to heaven. And we'll talk more about what that means next Sunday. And now, 10 days later, the Holy Spirit has poured himself out upon the women and men who have clung to their faith in Jesus. Amazing things are seen and heard, which demand explanation, if only to persuade the doubters that the disciples are not just drunk on cheap wine. So Peter has got a job to do. The crucifixion and resurrection take place during the great festival of Passover. The coming of the Holy Spirit takes place during the festival of Pentecost. Jerusalem would have been bursting with pilgrims, Jews from all over Palestine, from all over the Eastern Mediterranean, from all over the known world. Many having traveled a great distance on what was perhaps a once in a lifetime visit to Jerusalem would have stayed on for both festivals. So there is a good chance that many of the crowd who bade for Jesus' blood were part of the crowd listening to Peter that Pentecost. And even if any of the crowd had not been personally present to demand Jesus' execution, they were part of the religiosity that required Jesus to die in order to, in order for that uh, religious belief, that religious system to survive. And of course, they were citizens of Jerusalem, a city which had come to represent, in, in so many ways, disobedience to God. And they were human beings, part of humanity, which would rather that God died than that we be obedient to him. Last week, we heard the first part of Peter's explanation to the crowd. This week, Alison will read the middle portion of Peter's speech. Alison. We're reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 22 to 37. People at this year, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen. 
and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. And David said this about him. I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet, and he knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future, and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection, he was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honour in heaven at God's right hand, and the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honour at my right hand, until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Amen. We thank God for showing us the way of life through this, this living word. Thank you, Alison. The guy who lost his hard drive with 7,500 bitcoins on it. Bitcoins that today are worth over 42,000 pounds each. The record executives who turned down the Beatles, the publishers who rejected Harry Potter, the person who taped over the only video recording of the moon landing, the captain of the Titanic, the engineers who made the mistakes that led to nuclear disasters at Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, the driver who took a wrong turning and drove Archduke Ferdinand right into his assassin's line of fire, and so World War I was triggered. Have you ever come to the realization that you've done something really wrong? Have you ever suddenly understood that you've made a huge mistake with terrible consequences? If you have, and you most certainly have experienced something like that, then you'll know that it is a truly horrible feeling. For myself, it always seems to be a physical sensation of all the blood in my body draining abruptly through the soles of my feet, and it is horrible. Now imagine that you have played a part in the killing of the Son of God. You remember the story of Easter. Jesus, he'd done nothing wrong. He was entirely innocent. He loved and cared for people in astonishing ways, and God was clearly with them because he could do things which only God could do, and he spoke and he taught with such authority that people began to understand God in fresh ways, ways that freed them from the burdens of religiosity and a fear of failure. Despite this, because of this, powerful people wanted Jesus gone permanently. And to pressure the Romans into executing Jesus for them, the religious authorities whipped up the Passover crowd in Jerusalem to demand that Jesus be crucified. And that crowd was, of course, made up of ordinary people like you and me who trusted their leaders and allowed themselves to be persuaded that Jesus should die. And so the crowd threatened to riot if Pontius Pilate did not give in. And that not very brave Roman governor caved in and ordered Jesus to be flogged 
and killed. And so Jesus died upon a cross and he was buried. And that seemed to be it. All over, Jesus would never be heard of again. In fact, surely this was proof that the religious authorities who had hated Jesus, well, they were right all along. If Jesus really was the Messiah, God would never have allowed him to be killed. But now, a few weeks later, Peter is making that crowd think again. He's telling them things that they'd really rather not hear. He's forcing them to face up to the truth of who Jesus is, the truth of what they have done. Peter is one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and he's got a story to tell which casts Jesus in an entirely new night, new light. For Peter has met Jesus risen from the dead, just as Jesus had promised. The Holy Spirit had come at Pentecost, just as Jesus had promised. And Jesus rules all of creation with God because he is God, Lord and Messiah. And it all begins to make sense and the crowd can no longer escape what it has done. It takes just a few minutes for the Jerusalem crowd to go from intrigued to horrified, from amazed to devastated, from mocking to quaking. The truth, faced with the truth about Jesus, they recognize the truth about themselves, the truth about what they have done, of what they've been part of. And I can imagine the awful sensation of blood draining from their bodies as they realized that truth. What could be more devastating than it dawning upon you that you've had a hand in the killing of the Son of God? And that's what Peter tells the crowd that they have done. Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the apostles brothers what should we do and that I believe is one of the reasons why we in our time shy away from Jesus because the pain of realizing who he is and what we've done and are doing to him is too great to bear or so we imagine <laughs> you see people are not daft even those who mock the very notion of the son of God know enough to realize that they won't escape unscathed from an encounter with Jesus. They strongly suspect that their lives will be changed and they don't want that. And so it's easier to deny and to mock, no matter how rubbish they feel, no matter the pain they're causing to themselves or harm to others. Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him, to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Oh, no, no, no. We do not want that. We don't want to have to suffer that transforming pain which provokes such a, an incisive question, a penetrating question. Well, next week we'll hear how Peter answers that question and what the crowd begin to do in response. And will also reshape that answer for our lives today. But in these moments, I invite you to ask yourselves why you've never let the truth about Jesus pierce your heart. What big lie have you been telling yourself? Or maybe you once knew that pain and you once asked that question, but you've since learned to harden yourself against the truth of Jesus so that you no longer need to be changed. Why is that? Or is there someone you know, perhaps well, perhaps not, who needs to be cut to the quick by the knowledge that Jesus is Lord and Messiah, cut to the quick before they cut themselves to pieces with despair and guilt and regret? You see, asked of Jesus, what must I do, is the most important question you'll ever speak. We'll take this to God in prayer. Almighty God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit, you will heal us. First, you must pierce our hearts. You love us, and now you must show us how, in what ways we're still crucifying your Son. And then we will know him as Lord and Saviour. And we will ask, what should we do? And then we will be free. 
Amen. And now Alison is going to lead us in our prayers for others. Let us pray. Almighty God and loving Father, please hear our prayers for others. Sovereign Lord, you know we live today in a world of constant news that brings us glimpses of the chaos and confusion surrounding disaster and conflict across the world. The climate emergency, national elections, questions about the integrity of political leaders, and not least the ongoing pandemic. Protect us from the temptation to despair of these issues ever being resolved and lead us instead to be ever more constant and faithful in prayer. Merciful Lord, we pray once again for the people of India struggling with COVID-19 and especially we pray for supplies of oxygen and vaccines. For the government as they try to get these outbreaks under control and for so many people feeling overwhelmed and helpless. Lord, have mercy and lead other nations to continue helping generously and urgently. We pray too for Brazil, also coping with enormous numbers of COVID cases and other countries of which we hear less but who are struggling with far fewer of the resources which we have here. Lord, we are so thankful for the widespread rollout of the vaccination in the UK. We pray that international discussions would quickly reach appropriate conclusions about how to make COVID vaccines available to those countries who don't have the resources to make their own or to purchase adequate supplies. We pray for help for all who have suffered loss as a result of COVID. Loss of loved ones, loss of health, loss of income and livelihoods, education and opportunities. Loss of relationships as a result of the impact of restrictions and loss of safe places to retreat to in times of stress. We pray that they would know your sustaining love shown by others. Loving Lord, we pray for those in Mexico City dealing with the subway overpass collapse. We pray for the many injured taken to hospital and having to deal with both physical and mental trauma. We pray for those bereaved and those who are still trying to find out about relatives who haven't returned home and for the emergency services. We pray too for calm in the course of the investigations into this terrible incident. Father God, here at home we pray for our newly elected and re-elected representatives, that they would have renewed energy and desire to make a difference, seeking truth and justice in the process of decision making, and wisdom which comes only from you. As we approach the start of Christian Aid Week, we pray for the work of that organisation, the strength and encouragement for the project staff often working in very difficult conditions. Lord, prompt us to respond with faith and generosity, to reflect something of your love for all creation and to demonstrate our faith as followers of Jesus Christ, in whose strong and saving name we offer these prayers. Amen. Thank you, Alison. This Sunday morning in Kilimanjaro Church, we'll be listening to a song written and performed by Robin Mark. But because of copyright considerations, we can't include Line of Judah in this recording. But you can, if you wish, listen by clicking on the link which appears in the accompanying post, or if it uh, shows in the top right hand corner of your screen, you can click on the banner. And it's certainly worthwhile doing that. This song is powerful and uplifting, and the words restate so much of what we've been talking about. Jesus reigns. And now may the Father, the Son, the Spirit reign in your life so that you may have life and live it to the full. And now may God bless you and all whom you love, our church and our nation, now and always. Amen.